Hi, I'm John Hill with Timber King. What we're going to do in this video is go through and show you the correct way to operate and maintain your sawmill. The instructor will be showing you the points that you'll need to know to not only set up your mill, but also operate it in a safe and correct fashion. You should have a manual that you've read through already, and also a driver who delivered your mill should have went through these points with you. Or upon pickup, our instructors at the plant should have already went through a lot of these points as well. This video is designed to help you refresh your memory and help you to operate your mill correctly. If you do have questions after reviewing this video or reading through your manual, you can give us a call at 888-942-4406. We're there all the time to be helpful to you. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to give us a call. We'll go ahead and continue on and show you the points you need to know. Once you've selected a location for your sawmill, the first step will be to place the tire chocks underneath the tires to keep your mill from moving around once you unhook from your truck. The next thing you'll need to do is place the hardwood cribs underneath the jack stands. We recommend a minimum two by six by six feet long. These will provide you with a firm foundation to do your leveling and have your mill set up on. Once the cribs are in place, all you need to do is turn your jacks 90 degrees and replace the locking pin. Then simply lower the jack stand to touch the cribs and you're ready to start your leveling process. The first step in the leveling process will be your front to back level. You just spend a small amount of time on this. It's not critical to the operation of the mill. The next thing we'll do is we'll move on to the side to side level. For this, we'll place our one foot torpedo level on the cross members that will tell us how our level is side to side. In this particular instance, we are tilted just a little bit downhill or towards the loading side of the sawmill. So what we've got to do is raise that side up. The main thing to watch for in doing this is make sure your front and rear are both the same level. Once you've achieved level at front and rear, then all you've got to do is move to your center jacks, move them down so they just apply pressure. By using a four post quad beam design, the Timber King band mill is more stable and easier to set up than other mill designs. Our heavy duty structure also makes us less susceptible to setup variations that may be found in inferior mill designs. Some of the advantages of a well set up mill are less danger of logs rolling off the deck during loading or turning. And once properly set up, a mill will settle less and be sturdier than a mill that was set up in a hurry or rush. For example, if you pulled up on a job site and someone only had a few logs for you to saw and it wasn't going to take very long, you might be tempted to leave the mill still hooked to the truck and go ahead and set up and do your sawing. The reason this would not be a good thing is that the hitch would stay attached to the truck and when you raise the rest of the mill to level it, the front of the mill will stay down. It would just be very hard to level the mill out with it still attached to the truck. If you leave your mill in one location for any length of time, be sure and go back and double check your level. This will allow for ground sinkage or any vibration or movement your mill might have gone through. 
Once you're ready to cut, set your loaders off of their loader brackets on the frame and attach them with the hitch pins into the brackets on the side of the frame. It's very important to remember that you need to be able to get both pins into the loader brackets. If you can't, you may need to crib them up or you may need to dig out a little underneath them to allow them to fit properly. This way you get good support on your loaders without undue stress to your mill. The second pin that attaches the loaders to the frame are the ones that you also use for transporting the, the uh, head in place. Again, be sure and put both pins in the brackets. With your loaders pinned in place, you're now ready for the hydraulic hoses that run them. Simply remove them from the top side of the frame, disconnect them from each other, and then hook them onto the fittings on the rams of the loaders. Be sure when you're doing this that you keep the hoses out of the way so they won't be damaged by logs or can hooks or people. Another thing to keep in mind is that when you're hooking these, make sure that the hydraulic engine is not running. That could make them hard to connect. Now let's get down to cutting. The first step when you get ready to cut and load your log is to make sure that your stops are raised all the way. As you begin to load your log, be sure and stop when the log is parallel to the ground. That way you can load it by hand to avoid any heavy impacts or risk damaging your sawmill. Once your log is in place, you can use your turner arm to hold it in place, especially when your log is larger. That way you don't have to worry about cutting into it with your blade. When you make your first cut, the object is to not waste any more wood than you have to. A general rule is a one by four, three feet long. Try and take it easy in these bark cuts. That's where your blade life really suffers. We use this first cut to judge the density of the wood to tell how fast we can cut through it and how well it's going to saw up for us. One thing to be especially careful of is any knots or branches or chunks of bark that may be sticking off of the, off the log in your way. This particular oak had many different things to watch for. Another good reason to keep your first slab size small, besides less waste of lumber, is that the slabs are going to be a little easier to handle. We've got a pretty good size smooth area on the top of that log, so now we'll go ahead and turn it 90 degrees. To do that, we'll just bring the carriage back sight down the log, make sure everything's clear. Remove the locking clamp, make sure your hydraulic stops are all the way up, and then begin the turn. An important thing to remember when turning is try to be easy on the wood. The smoother and more consistent you are, the less wood waste you'll have. You'll notice for this cut, we've left the turner arm up as well as engaged the spike to lock it in place. This is common when you're cutting a big log like this. You can use the turner to hold it in place. Be sure when you're cutting a log like this one, where you can see the checks and cracks in the end of the log, that indicates that it's been cut for a while. 
and it may have seasoned on the ends. Could be uh, two to four inches. Be sure and ease into the cut as this wood will be harder. Also, you may want to slow down just a bit when you're exiting the cut for the same reason. We always run a little bit of lube on the blade to keep any pitch that may be present from building up. This is important in any type of wood to be sure your blade stays clean. What we did with this log is we eventually split it into two 10 inch wide pieces. And from there we turned it 90 degrees so we could cut two by tens all the way down. This takes a little bit of practice and what you may have to do occasionally is lift up the second piece. It may not want to turn with the other one. It's just a matter of standing it straight up. A little bit of practice and you'll get the hang of that. Be sure now that you've got those separate pieces up that you use your turner chain or your spike to push the wood over against your stops. That way it's held firmly. You can also now move your guide arm in. Usually one to two inches away from your wood is a good, good rule of thumb. As you get ready to make these cuts, especially after you've turned the log, watch and make sure your hydraulic stops are clear, and your turner arm is down out of the way. Your cut will clear the stop, the spike, and the loader arms. Once we get into these cuts, that's where we'll really make our time. We're not cutting through bark, so we don't have to drag any dirt or bark or anything through the cut. We can generally cut pretty quickly in these cuts. As we're in these cuts, since our cutting engine is always at full throttle, we can listen to the governor of the engine to tell what kind of a load we're placing on it. That's a good way to determine how fast you can cut. You also want to consider that the faster you cut, the more you load that engine, the shorter your overall blade life will be. It just puts uh, extra stress on the blade to push the blade through a cut faster. You want to continue to use blade lube to keep the pitch from building up on your blade. That lube can consist mainly of water, sometimes a little bit of soap, a little bit of lubricant or antifreeze if you're cutting in the winter. As you get down to your final cuts, you'll be able to go ahead and lower your loader arms to get them out of the way. We've left them up just as a safety precaution, but now that we're not going to turn this log anymore, we can go ahead and put them down so we won't have to walk around them. When you're off bearing your wood, be sure, especially if you're going to stack it to dry, be sure to put stickers, generally 12 to 16 inches apart. That'll limit the amount of warpage and uh, wood damage you get from drying. Now we'll cover some of the greasing locations on the mill. The first one is the screw jacks for leveling the mill. Usually once a month on these is plenty. The tow board rollers will hit about once every 40 hours, once at each end. The dog spike drive shaft, once every 40 hours. There's one at each end, be sure and hit them both. The dog nut, once every eight hours, every day. And here's the other end of the dog nut drive shaft. The turner shaft, you'll hit every eight hours. The drive shaft for the log stops every 40 hours. We have bearings on those. At the top of the carriage, you'll find one bearing at the top of each of the lift screws. Once every 40 hours is good on greasing these. It's one on each side. At the bottom of the carriage, on each corner, you'll find a grease search for the roller there. Once a day is good for these. The large bearings on your saw drive shaft only need to be greased about once every 160 hours. Too much grease will cause them to fail prematurely. 
The carriage drive shaft at the rear of your mill has three bearings. One at the left corner, one in the center, and one on the right. You'll hit these about once every 40 hours. When greasing points on the mill, it's important to remember not to put too much grease into a bearing. A half a squirt is usually good on a bearing. Any place that's a bushing or non-bearing location can take one to two squirts of grease with no problem. You can use a wire brush to clean the grease and old sawdust out of the threaded rods. If you have the cover kit that covers the top and bottom side of the threaded rods, you may only have to do this once a week. When you put the grease back on, it's a good idea to just use your finger and be generous. Too much grease is not a bad thing. Here you can see the oil drain line for the blade drive engine. Most manufacturers recommend that after the first five hours you change the oil and filter and then every hundred hours after that. Be sure and check your owner's manual. You'll find the same type of a drain line on the hydraulic pump engine. Again, be sure and read your owner's manual to find out exactly when the manufacturer recommends an oil change. Now we've got some tips on adjusting and handling your saw blade. The first step is removing the blade covers. To do this, simply turn the three prong knobs to loosen the cover and then slide it off the outside. Be sure not to run your sawmill or have the blade engaged when you're doing any operations with the covers off. Loosen the tension on the blade by turning the tension screw handle counterclockwise. And then simply pull the blade forward off the blade wheels and slide it out from the covers. Be careful while you're handling the saw blade here that you don't damage any of the teeth on any of the metal parts of the sawmill. That may cause it to cut poorly next time you use this blade. Here's one method for coiling a blade up. As always with handling a blade, be sure you have leather gloves on. With one foot, step on the bottom of the blade to hold it in place. And with one palm, place it up, grasp the blade, and twist. As you twist, push down a little bit and allow the blade to coil itself up. Once it's done that, simply remove your hand and grasp the blade by all three pieces. And you've got one blade coiled ready to store. To uncoil your blade, separate it into two separate components, the figure eight shown here on the bottom and the circle, which is in the right hand of the operator. Turn the bottom of the figure eight towards you. Grasp the top corners of the circle, dropping the bottom of the figure eight free, and then just open your hands. The blade will uncoil in front of you. Be sure when you do this, there's no people or objects near you that could be damaged by this operation. Another thing you may want to try to do until you get good at this is just toss the blade into some soft grass. That will let it coil open on its own. To reinstall the blade, simply uncoil it, verify that the teeth are pointing the right direction. They should be pointing towards the drive side of the mill. Then thread the blade through the post of the mill back onto the wheels. Be careful when you're doing this that you don't damage any of the teeth on the guards or the wheels or the covers. Once you get the blade in place, slide it onto the blade wheels, placing the back edge of the blade 5 16 of an inch from the back edge of the blade wheels. This is about where you're going to want this blade to run. Once it's in place, Run your tension up to 1,200 pounds. You can double check this by measuring the yellow spring. One and seven eighths inches equals 1,200 pounds. Be sure after you've run a new blade for a while that you double check your tension, either by measuring or checking the gauge. One and seven eighths. When you're done sawing for the day, be sure to detension the blade. This will relieve any undue stress from the blade, the sawmill, or the bearings. We recommend about 500 pounds. This is also a good time to check out your mill. 
Check for things like buildup on the blade, caused by too much pitch or not enough lubrication. Flat spots on the guide roller, which could be caused by obstructions stopping the wheel from turning. Let's look now at blade tracking. Tracking of the blade on the wheels is the most important adjustment you'll have to make on your sawmill. Shouldn't have to be done very often, but you need to know how to do it to maintain your blade. The tools you'll need to adjust the tracking on the idle side are a 3 8 inch drive ratchet, a 3 inch extension, 5 16 allen drive, and 7 16 inch socket. When we say tracking, we're referring to the distance from the back edge of the blade to the back edge of the blade wheel. We're going to adjust that by moving this wheel on its axis left to right. You should not have to adjust your tracking with every blade change. It is, however, a good idea to check it every time you change the blade. If you do need to adjust it, be sure to adjust from both sides so both sides are at 5 16 We'll run the blade tracking in a range of 1 quarter to 3 eighths of an inch, with 5 16 being optimum. So we're going to adjust the tracking on the back side of this head to bring it back down to 5 16 We're doing our adjustment to the rear right hand side of the saw head assembly to adjust the idle side tracking. What we want to do, since we want to move the blade back, is we will turn the locking the jam bolt counterclockwise to loosen it up. Approximately half a turn. Then turn the adjustment bolt, which is the one with the washer, clockwise, approximately a quarter of a turn. Then re-tighten the jam bolt to lock everything back in place. Move back to the front. Now we'll rotate this wheel by hand to see where the blade tracking is now that we've adjusted it. As you can see, we've had it, it's tracked way too far back. It's almost flush with the back edge of the wheel. And remember, ideally, we want it at 5 16ths from the back of the wheel to the back of the blade. So we'll need to go back now and readjust to get it back forward. When you move the blade forward, the first thing you can do is loosen the adjustment. You don't have to loosen the lock before you do that. To be sure after every adjustment, you tighten the lock. Now let's turn and see where it's at. That looks pretty close. Five sixteenths of an inch. That's right where we want to track. This is where you'll get the best blade life and best cutting. Whenever you're doing any tracking adjustments, it will affect both sides. When I adjust the idle side, it will affect the drive side and vice versa. So whenever you do any tracking adjustments, you want to have both covers off so you can check your tracking as you go. If you have one side further out of spec than the other, that'll be the side you want to start with. For example, if the idle side were at one quarter of an inch and the drive side were at 3 16 you would adjust the drive side first since it was farther away from 5 16 than the idle side. The tools you'll need for adjusting the drive side tracking are 3 8 inch ratchet, a 6 inch 3 8 drive extension, 7 16 socket, 3 8 open end wrench, 9 16 wrench, and 15 16 wrench. Using the 7 16 socket and ratchet, you will need to remove the cover over the drive belt on the drive side.
all the bolts on this Timber King bandsaw mill are standard SAE American threads. The only exception to that would be the bolts that are actually on the engines themselves, and those are metric. It's also true of Allen wrenches. Once you have the rear cover off, go ahead and remove the front cover so we can see where the blade's tracking. Anytime you're working around your bandsaw mill, whether you're sawing lumber or maintaining the machine, it's a good idea to wear proper safety precaution equipment. It can be gloves, safety glasses, anything else that will keep you from getting hurt. Now that we've got the cover off, we can measure again, just like we did on the idle side, and see where the blades track. For this side, we want the exact same measurement as we had for the other side. We want 5 sixteenths of an inch. In this case, we happen to have it already. But what we'll do is we'll go ahead and show how, it, how to adjust it anyway. Using your 9 sixteenths wrench, you can loosen the locking nut on your adjustment bolt. That will allow you to be able to move your adjustment bolt to do your blade tracking. The next thing you'll do is loosen the two bolts at the top and bottom of the bearing housing using your 15 16 wrench. Once these are loose, you can make your blade adjustments. Just use your 3 8 inch drive square socket extension and place it right over the head of that square headed adjustment bolt. We're just using that as an extension so we don't have to get our hands cleared down inside by that belt. Okay. Use your 3 8, 3 8 inch wrench to turn the extension. To move the blade forward, we'll turn the, turn the adjustment bolt counterclockwise. Cause this bearing housing to come out, pivoting the blade wheel forward or sideways and let the blade move forward on the wheel. Now our blade tracking is really out there. If the, blade, if the blade is too far forward on the wheel, all you've got to do is loosen the two bolts, loosen the jam bolt, and then tighten your adjustment bolt clockwise. Usually about a quarter turn at a time, just enough to see how much movement you get. Try and make small adjustments. And then rotate the blade by hand to see if you made the progress you need. And I see I need to go a little farther yet. So again, clockwise and turn. Five sixteenths. Lock the fifteen sixteenths nuts on the bearing housing. Bottom one. Top one. Now lock down your adjustment bolt using a nine sixteenths wrench. Now all that's left is to recheck. Make sure everything stayed where it's at. Right on the money. So now we can put our cover back on and we're done tracking. Since we've adjusted the tracking on one side, we always want to double check and see how it's affected the tracking on the other side. So I'll simply come over here with my tape measure and see that I've still got 5 sixteenths of an inch right where it needs to be. Anytime we're doing any blade changing or tracking adjustments, it's a good idea to check the condition of these wipers. 
These are the wipers that keep the sawdust from building up on the blade wheel. If they're damaged or not working properly, sawdust will build up on this wheel and it will affect your blade tracking. So check and make sure they've got a fair amount of tension and that they're in good shape both sides. The belt tension for the main saw drive shaft is factory set, but if you ever need to adjust it, you can usually tell, you can tell it needs adjusting when in a heavy cut under load, you see a lot of movement in the belt as you're cutting, or if it starts squealing or slipping. If it does need adjustment, all you've got to do is loose, remove this bowl with a 9 16 wrench, loosen the lock nut that holds it in place, and lengthen this rod by unscrewing one of the turnbuckles off the rod. Then put the bolt back in, and it lengthens the distance that you're actually tightening the belt. About one inch deflection by hand is where you want the belt tension. Too little tension on the belt can lead to belt slipping, uh, which would damage your belt, and also all the power not getting from the engine to the blade, which will result in a slower or not quite as good a cut. You'll want to check your belt tension approximately every month just to verify it's not, it's not an item that's going to wear quickly, but you will need to keep an eye on it. There's one adjustment to be made on the side of the dog spike. That allows it to have enough tension to stand up when you hit the engagement lever, like so. If you ever notice that it's not wanting to stand up the way it should, just about a quarter of a turn on that adjustment screw is all it takes. When pinning your leveling jacks into place, be sure to put the pin in from the top side. This provides much better stability for your sawmill than using the side-to-side -side holes. When transporting your mill, you'll want to transport it with the gas tank off of the mill as well as the water tank. To put them back on, it's just a matter of setting the tank in its bracket and connect the quick fitting. All you've got to do to work this fitting is pull back on the collar and it disconnects and push straight on to reconnect. Water jug sits in its bracket. You route the hose down to the water line fitting on the adjustable guide roller arm. Once it's in place, you can use the valve on the water tank as an on off and use the valve at the adjustable arm to set the flow. Try and position the beaded line approximately a third of the way from the rear of the blade. That seems to provide the best location for lubrication on the blade. Usually a trickle of lubrication is all that's required to keep the pitch from building up on the blade. Each day before you start your sawing, you'll want to check all your fluid levels on the machine. This includes hydraulic fluid, gasoline in your small engine, oil in your small engine, gasoline for the big engine, and oil in the big engine, as well as your blade lubricant. Uh, you'll also want to check regularly the battery, your fuel and oil filters, and hydraulic filters on the mill. You'll want to change your hydraulic fluid and filter regularly. Be sure to check your manual to find out exactly what fluid is approved for that uh, system. It'll take five gallons in the tank, plus two more gallons that's actually in the system. Uh, engine oil is standard, uh, standard 10W30 weight. Uh, again, be sure and follow your manufacturer's recommendations for changing those every five hours and every hundred hours. The Timber King's two hydraulic roller tow boards allow you to reposition your log on the mill for optimum turning. We're going to talk a little bit about log stop maintenance. The two things we want to watch for is height. If, for example, this stop were higher than the rest, you could clear this stop while you were cutting one of your low cuts 
and run into this one accidentally. Uh, the other thing we're going to touch on is the actual squareness of the stop to the deck. If the stop isn't square, then when you put your can up against this, making your cuts, you won't make a square can. The tools we'll need to square the log stops to the cutting deck are a carpenter square and two three quarter inch wrenches. In checking to see if your stop is square to the cutting deck, use your carpenter square and just place it across the cross member so it's flat. Next, just grab a hold of the chain on the stop and pull it back to simulate a log leaning against it. This is where your this is where your stop's going to be while you're cutting. Then all you've got to do is check with your square to see that the stop is perfectly square to the deck. This stop is leaning inside just a little bit, so what we'll have to do is loosen it up and adjust it. To do so, we'll first loosen the adjustment bolt on the outside edge with our three quarter inch wrenches. We just need this to be loose enough that the stop can pivot. Next, we'll go down here and loosen the jam nut that locks it down. And then we can adjust our stop with this bolt. We'll also loosen the pivot bolt to make it a little easier for it to move. Under this bolt is a slot which allows the stop to pivot up and down. The front bolt is the actual pivot point. The rear one's slotted to allow it to move up and down. That's how we achieve our adjustment in and out. Next, we'll retighten our pivot bolt. And finally, we'll lock our jam nut in place to keep anything from moving around. Then we'll recheck, make sure we're still square. Again, always pull back on the stop to make sure it's right up and down. Perfect. The tools we'll need to adjust the height of the log stops are a tape measure and two 9 16 inch wrenches. The first thing we'll do to check to see that our stops are level or at the same height is measure them all. We want to measure from the cross member to the top of the stop. We measure each one and compare them, they should all be identical. One sixteenth inch tolerance in between them. Uh, if you have any difference between them, you wanna make sure that the closest one to your saw head is the tallest. That way you can see when you're spotting down, when you're sawing, you can check and see. If you're gonna clear the first one, you'll clear them all. We measured our stops and we found out that this one is out of adjustment. It's just a little bit taller than the others. Remember, as a rule, the two stops that are farthest from your saw head need to be lower than the first one. If they're not, you could accidentally saw into one of them after you'd cleared the first one. Since this one is too tall, what we have to do is we have to loosen the nuts. There are two, there are four nuts on this chain. We have to loosen the two that are on the bottom sides of the angle plates. Loosen them, and then we'll retighten, take the tension and back out of the chain and lock it down. That will move the stop down the amount we need. Conversely, if we needed to move this stop up, all we would have to do is loosen the two nuts that are on top of these angle plates, one here and one down below. After we, had, after we loosen those, we simply take the slack out of the chain and lock the opposite nuts down, and it's recheck our measurement with a tape measure, and that's all there is to it. As always, before we start working on our Timber King, we want to make sure we have the proper safety attire. 
glasses, and gloves. Next, we'll set the log loaders off onto the ground. First, you have to remove the travel pin and set it out of the way. Slide the loader up to its bracket. Line up the hole and replace this pin. Now we have both loaders on the ground. We've connected the hydraulic hoses to the front loader. We'll connect these. They're matched male and female, so you can't hook them up wrong. Wipe the tips of any dust that's on there. That'll keep uh, contaminants from getting in your system. Do the same thing for the fittings. And then just push co to connect. If, if you disconnect these hydraulic hoses while the hydraulic pump engine is running, you may build up pressure on one side or the other. If that happens, all you've got to do is pull the hydraulic actuator valve at the control bank either uh, forward or reverse, and then give one pull on the starter rope. Then try to reconnect them. If that doesn't work, move the handle the opposite direction, and then give one pull. That should relieve the pressure enough you can hook up. When I remove the pins from the head that we've had in here for travel, they're identical to the pins that hold the loaders in place. And these are the pins that will go in the lower, the lower holes and hold the loaders in place. It's important to have both pins in each loader before you start operating the mill. The pin from the drive side of the head will go into the bottom hole on the front loader. Be sure the cotter pin is secure so the pin can't come loose any time during the operation of the mill. We've uh, positioned the jacks so they're all down, the mill's level, the loaders are in place and pinned. We've removed the pins from the head. We've got tension on the blade, fuel tank, water tank, everything's in place. Uh, now we're ready to operate the machine itself. Don't let the number or complexity of the controls intimidate you. This is a very simple machine to operate and after just a little bit of time, you'll have it down. First thing we'll do is start the hydraulic pump motor all you've got to do is turn the switch on. Switch on, which is to the right. We'll give it just a little choke at about half throttle. Pull the starter, and then we'll pull the choke back. Now we've got some system pressure. We're ready to operate now. I'll start out with the first control you see from the left side of the mill. When you're ready to go, give about half throttle to your hydraulic pump motor. We'll move the lever forward to start the head moving forward. Since there's no movement in the head right now, it means I need to give it a little more speed with this control. Now I've got movement. The farther counterclockwise I turn it, the faster it'll go. Be sure not to run into your stops. Be sure to lower them out of the way, as well as your dog spike, turner arm, or any other item that could be in the way of your saw head. Keep that in mind whenever you're cutting. Anything that can get in the way is subject to being hit. Now, staying on the same lever, when you bring the lever back towards you, it's unregulated speed. In other words, it's wide open on the return. Vary the speed going forward with this knob. Slower, faster. Return is wide open. Second knob we're going to look at, second control we're going to look at. 
is the log dog spike. Moving the lever forward, engages, raises the spike and engages it into the log. Moving the lever backward, removes the spike from the log and gets it out of your way. All you've got to do is move the lever far enough that it gets the spike out of your way or forward far enough that it runs straight into the log and locks it in place. The third lever from the left is log stops. If your mill is equipped with hydraulic log stops, moving the lever forward raises those stops. Moving the lever back lowers them again. You can stop anywhere in between, fine tune your adjustment to get the right height, up or down. Again, be sure to keep them out of your way when you get ready to cut. Make sure your blade will clear the stops. The next lever over is the hydraulic tow board. It also has a selector valve that goes with it. The selector valve is labeled back, both, and front. What that means is if you're switched here, it means you're going to operate the back tow board when you move this valve. If you're switched here, you're going to operate both tow boards when you move this valve. And if it's here, you only operate the front tow board. So if you need to raise or lower just the front end or just the back end, or if you want to raise them both so you can reposition the log on the carriage, that's how it works. Back tow board, lever forward raises it, lever backward lowers it. Works the same in any position. Middle position, both, raises both tow boards at once or lowers them both at once right hand position or front position, raises the front tow board, lowers the front tow board. The next two levers we're going to talk about together. They operate the log turner. The right hand lever is the log turner arm. Move it forward, raises the turner arm so you can turn your log. Moving it back, lowers it down out of the way. Move the left lever forward, moves the chain towards the off bearer side, the left hand side of the mill. Moving the lever back, moves the chain towards the loading side, the right hand side of the mill. Use these two levers together whenever you want to turn a log, raise it up, turn a little bit, raise a little more, turn, let it down, turn. You'll get very comfortable where you can run these two together and get the right amount of turning power that you need for whatever log you're running. That's another one. Be sure when you're done with the turner or when you're cutting, make sure your blade will clear the turner arm. Make sure it's down far enough out of the way. The last lever on the control is the log loader lever. Moving this lever forward raises the hydraulic cylinders that load your log. Make sure whenever you're doing this that you've raised your log stops all the way up so that the log can't accidentally roll onto the mill and off the other side. Also, it's a good idea at this time, before you get your log loaded, make sure your spike is out of the way, tow boards are down, and your turner arm is down. As you load your big log, you'll bring it up so that the loader arms are parallel to the ground. At that point, you'll want to go ahead and go up and push it on by hand. It's a little easier on the machine that way. Once you get the log on the machine, you can then use your turner arm to raise the log up and put closer to your stops. That way it'll put it in a position you need to cut. Just a note on the log loaders, be sure as you get down to make your final bottom cuts that you have them all the way down out of the way. The log stops, the log spike, turner arm, tow boards and loaders all need to be out of the way of the blade before you make a cut. We have one more control on the control panel. It controls the electric motor on top of the carriage that raises and lowers the blade. It's just a toggle switch right here in the corner. Pushing the toggle switch forward raises the head. Pushing the toggle switch back lowers the head. You can also fine tune this adjustment anywhere in between. Very accurate adjustment. 
when we're getting ready to cut, we get ready to start the big engine and the big system, we make sure our blade tension is up, 1,200 pounds or an inch and seven eighths on the spring. Make sure we've got our fuel tank connected, water tanks in place. Want to disconnect the drive mechanism, raise this lever, it disconnects the drive belt. It also applies the brass brake to keep the blade from turning while you're starting the engine. To start the engine, you need to give it just a little throttle, a little choke. Now you're ready to key it. Once you've got your engine started, be sure to turn on the blade lubrication water. Now you're ready to cut. Bring your hydraulic system up to about half throttle. Your blade engine to full throttle. This hydraulic control bank, all these valves control your hydraulic operations of the mill. The three valves on the left end have limiters on them. The reason they do that is so we can control the amount of power available to each operation. Just wanted to take a minute to show you how to adjust them and what pressure they should be set at. The first valve is the valve that moves your saw head forward. You want to set it at 1,300 pounds forward and reverse. You can do that by locking the head in place with the travel pins and then as you engage the lever, with it locked in place, your pressure gauge should read 1,300 pounds. The second lever is for the log dog spike. We want to limit its pressure to 1,400 pounds going into the log, which is forward on the lever, and 1,500 pounds coming out of the log, which is backward on the lever. Uh, we do that so that the, log ha the spike has more power coming out so it can't accidentally stick in the wood. We also want to limit the forward pressure so it doesn't do too much damage to the wood while it's holding the log in place. The third lever adjusts the pressure to the hydraulic stop system. We put it at 700 pounds up, 700 pounds down. If we do that, this system is not made to have any, any uh, this is not a load bearing system. It's made to operate only when there's no pressure on the stops. It's not made to lift the log or support the log. So we limit the pressure of this system to 700 pounds up, 700 pounds down. The backside controls anything you do to moving the lever backward. If your pressure on the head coming back is too low, you adjust it here. If the pressure on the head going forward is too low, you do it on the other side. But the adjustments look identical to these. You'll need a 9 16 wrench to loosen the lock nut and a 5 30 seconds Allen wrench to do the actual adjusting of the pressure. Then again, just read the pressures out on your gauge with your hydraulic motor running about half throttle. The first thing we're gonna do when we get ready to put the mill away for the end of the day cutting is we're gonna lower the head. Once the head reaches its bottom point, it has an electronic limit switch that keeps it from going too far. It'll automatically cut off. It has the same switch on top, so while you're cutting, you can't raise the head too high. It will automatically stop when it gets to the top. Now that the head's all the way down, we can remove our gas tank and water tank, quick connect fittings. Be sure to keep the gas line up out of the way for travel so it doesn't get tangled up with anything. Set your water tank off and take it with you. Remove the water line and the tank. <laughs> now we'll want to start the hydraulic motor to get all the hydraulic systems in position for travel. That consists of the head, the log stops, the log loaders, and the spike. The first position for traveling with the saw head is using the rear bracket that's attached to the saw head and this front hole that's in the frame. 
That puts the most weight on the ton. And generally, that's best for travel. The second position would be the next step back. Use this bracket, the front bracket on the saw head, in the same hole. That puts the head back about 18 inches further. A little less tongue weight, a little different trailer characteristics. The last position where you can put the saw head would be to move the head so that the front bracket on the head, I'm sorry, last position is going to be to move the back, back bracket on the saw head to line up with the back pole on the frame. That gives you the least amount of tongue weight. We'll put our pin in the rear bracket on the saw head and the front hole in the carriage. Pin in place, lock the pin in with your cotter key. That side's ready to travel. We'll take the bottom pin from the loader bracket on this side and put it in the corresponding hole on this head. Again, lock it in place with your cotter pin. Now your saw head's all the way down, it's locked it in place, the head is ready to travel. We now want to make sure that all of the rest of our hydraulic systems are in place. We want the hydraulic loaders to be up so the bottom of them is clear of the bottom of the frame. We want to make sure that the dog spike is near the middle of the frame. We'll use it later to secure the hydraulic lines. You want to put the loader arms near the bottom of their travel. Yeah. You generally won't want them all the way down because that can lead to hydraulic system lock. The first thing we'll want to do in getting our loader system ready to go is disconnect the hydraulic lines. We do that by lining up lining up the bead with the notch in the fittings and just pushing the, the notch toward the bead. They'll come right apart. Make sure the ends of them are clean, hook them together, set them out of the way. Now we have the hydraulic hoses disconnected. We can unpin the loader, set the pin out of the way for just a minute. Pull the loader out and turn it and add, uh, it'll actually load in on its back side here. So I'll stand it up, set it in its bracket, and lock it down. Once it's in its bracket, take your pin, and lock it in place. Don't forget the gutter key. To travel, be sure and get your hydraulic loader hoses, put them on top of your frame, and loop them over your stops to keep them from getting damaged while you're traveling. It's a good idea to also loop them over the dog. That gives them a sturdy place to hang on to while you're moving. All we have left is to make sure our manual stop is up and locked in place. Bring our jack stands up and make sure they're stored in their vertical horizontal position and we'll be ready to travel. To check your chain tension, simply come up here, grasp the chain on the top side of the mill with two fingers and lift up. With moderate pressure, you should not be able to lift it above the cross members on the sawmill. If you can, on either side, you'll need to make an adjustment back here at the adjustment place. To tighten the chain, you'll want to do both sides evenly to keep the carriage tracking straight on the frame. The way we'll do that is we'll just loosen the locking bolts, which are on the chain side of the adjuster. Just loosen them enough they're out of the way. With a 9 16 wrench, we'll then tighten the actual adjustment bolt. Just give it a couple turns on each side. We want to keep it even so we don't get things crooked. If the chain does happen to turn on you while you're tightening, be sure and straighten it back before you lock everything in place. Now my chains are straight, I've tightened the chain up. I run the lock nut back up against there. And 
and I should be good to go. The one way that I'll need to check this is I'll move the entire head back. I want to make sure that both sides of the carriage hit the end of the frame at the same time. That tells me that the carriage is sitting square on the frame. Once you put your, once you've got your jack up, snap down your receiver so it locks in place. Connect your safety chains and your light and brake connector to your tow vehicle.